Uh, so today's session, office hours, if you've been to one of these in the past, it's kind of an informal session. We're going to, uh, we've got a presentation. We've got some questions that we uh, went unanswered at our previous session. We've also got a couple of questions that were submitted during registration. So we're going to go through those, but if you have any additional questions or you, um, you know, want to speak to us today, you can just do that. And so it's kind of an informal session. We're going to answer some questions and hope that we, everyone has a good time. We are the Florida LTAP Center. We offer a lot of services to our agencies um, that are at no cost to those local agencies in Florida. Our website is floridaltap.org and our social media handle is FLLTAP. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Todd to get us started today. So Todd, let me make you presenter and let's get started. All right, that sounds fantastic to me. And I just wanna welcome you to office hours. And as Kristen said, this is really informal. I mean, we're, we're gonna share a cup of coffee together. We're gonna to be answering some of the questions that were submitted during the webinar series that we didn't get to. And I had those prepared, I'll answer those for you. But we're also gonna stop often and answer questions that you might have. Now, as we do that, um, answer the questions that you might have, I also wanna ask for a little bit of grace and a little bit of forbearance with that, because the MUTCD is a big book. You know, it's like 800, over 800 pages. So it's quite possible that you'll ask me a question that I'm not sure the answer of. But if I'm not sure, that's something I'll share with you. I'll say, yeah, I'm not sure about that. And it could be something that we'll be able to look up. I also have a uh, the latest version of the MUTCD with, with revision three that was placed in September of last year. I have that pulled up and ready to refer to as well. And we may end up looking up some of those items. Also, as you're listening, if you have any thoughts, comments, or maybe answers to assist, you know, I could, I may turn it back to you because I know that joining us today, we have a lot of people that have a tremendous amount of experience. We have some newcomers, but also people with experience. And if that's you, hey, I, we would love to have some help and some assistance answering these questions if we're not sure of the answer. So feel free to type that into the question box as well, because we'd, again, love to hear from you. So that's a little bit about the format. Let's go ahead and, um, talk about the questions themselves. And we're gonna cover questions again from registration, parts one, two, and three. And as Kristen said, you can also raise your hand. That's a unique feature of today's office hours that we don't normally have. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. We're scheduled to go for about an hour and a half, but that may be more or less depending upon the questions that we have. So let's dive in. We'll look at a couple of questions from registration. and Here's one that, I don't know, sometimes we get fairly often. It's talking about bike lanes, uh, bike sharrows. Those are the shared use arrows that might be placed on the pavement. And the question that came in said, where should bike lanes and bike sharrows be placed on small town residential roads? So we're talking about small towns, city streets, and the question was bike lanes and bike sharrows. Well, when we, we think about bike lanes or bike sharrows, the first thing that comes to my mind is that means that you have individuals on bikes or you want to encourage individuals to be on bicyclists or be, to be on bicycles, so you have bicyclists. The next thing that, in my opinion, you should think about is well, how much traffic do we have? And what are those operating speeds? And that is in your decision, on whether to place bike lanes or not. But then we also wanna make sure that we have sufficient width for those bike lanes. What I did, because it's it's complicated, or and it really requires a study to determine, do we need these on this particular residential street? It's not actually covered in the METCD. The METCD, Manual and Uniform Traffic Control Devices, gives us information about how do we mark those bike lanes? You know, and what, what do the lanes look like? Um, where should they be placed as far as in relation to parking areas and things of that nature, uh, but also sharrows, when they would be options, when you might be able to use those. But 
and how they would be placed, but the decision on when to install a bike lane, the best guidance for that comes from the AASHTO, that's the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials Guide to the Development of Bicycle Facilities. So I would encourage you to, to check that out. Uh, here's one that you can download free of charge, the Federal Highway Administration's Bikeway Selection Guide. I've got a picture of that on the right-hand side. It's fairly new, February of 2019. And I have a quote from it. And it says, when we're talking about installing a bikeway for bicyclists, that selection depends on the traffic volume. How much traffic do we have, the operating speed, um, and the functional classification of that particular roadway. Now, as far as where the markings go, that's when you go to the MUTCD. And all this is covered in part nine or section nine. So I would encourage you if you wanna know more about what those markings look like, how they're placed, where they're placed if you decide to have that bike lane, that's in part nine of the MUTCD. For example, this says, if used, bicycle lane, word, symbol, and or arrow markings, see figure 9C-3, this is 9C-3, should be placed at the beginning of the bicycle lane and at periodic intervals along the bike lane based on engineering judgment. And if you notice, there's three different, sim or three different options for those word, symbol, and arrow markings. Now, that's the bike lane. We also had the mention of the bike Shero, and this is a bike Shero. Um, it's essentially indicating that the bicyclist is using this lane of travel with the public. So it's a shared use lane with that particular lane of travel. And the question is, where should those be used? Well, again, part nine of the MUTCD gives us some more information. For the shared lane marking symbol, it says, it gives you options A through E. So it could be used to assist bicyclists with lateral positioning uh, when you have on-street parallel parking. Uh, it could be used to alert road users of the lateral location of bicyclists are likely to occupy within the travel way. And then it has some um, other information about where to put that, where to put these shared lane markings, you know, actually distances. The guidance given though here on paragraph two says the shared lane markings should not be placed on roadways that have a speed limit above 35 miles per hour. That's because when the speeds get higher, it's not as safe for bicyclists. So in that, in that uh, study that you do to consider whether to add a bike lane, you're also gonna be looking at the speed. And that mirrors what we saw uh, in the bikeway in the bikeway selection guide yeah, so we're going to be thinking about that operating speed all right so hopefully that gives you a bit more information about that question and points you in the right direction um, each again situation would be unique but that's where i would get the information if i was going to study that here's another question that came in registration it says can you speak to signs and markings to improve safety um, at local road T intersections? And yes, I can. So this is something that we cover in a workshop called Low Cost Safety Improvements. And I included a few of the slides from that workshop just to talk about those T intersections and local roads. This is some of the intersection signage that you might use from a safety standpoint. Uh, but when do you use it? And what I like to do is actually walk through a T intersection. And I, I like pictures. Pictures seem to speak to me better than words do. So I'm going to walk through this with um, this photo. And what we have here is a T intersection. This is a county road, two county roads. The one going left or right does not stop. The one going into the photo does. So it's a T intersection with this leg of the T uh, that stops. And as you're looking at this, I do want to get you involved. So I'm curious, type into the chat box, if this was a local agency that came to you and said, how can we make this better? How can we improve safety? What would you tell them? So in, 
in the uh, question box, type that in, and Kristen, if you could tell me some of the answers that you get. You guys type in, what would you give advice to a local agency in this situation to improve safety? All right, sounds good. So everyone, you can find the <clears throat> questions or chat section and type in some of your recommendations for um, this photo that you see on the screen. Um, so I'm seeing, might wanna add a stop ahead sign, uh, maybe some warning signage for the dead end. Uh, also looks like the stop sign is perhaps too low. Uh, maybe adding cross, tra cross traffic does not stop sign. Um, end of the road markers and dead end sign. Maybe increase the size of the, of the sign. Add lane lines, uh, end of the road treatment with large double arrows and object markers, uh, chevrons, and uh, maybe another stop sign on the other side. So those are some of the responses coming in here. And those are fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Kristen, for reading those. And, and I appreciate you guys sharing those. That speaks to the, the experience that we have listening today. Well, let me just give you some of my thoughts. And many of these are the same things that you just mentioned. And when I worked for the DOT, this is probably the order that we would have went in. Now, this, these options for upgrading the visibility of the intersection, they come from the MUTCD. But the order is my own order. It's just how we like to do it. First thing we would have done is upgraded the size of that stop sign. So 30 inches is the minimum size. We would have went up to a 36 or a 48 inch stop sign. You could have also, as you said, someone said it was too low. You could make sure it was the right height, five feet from the bottom of the sign down to the bottom of the, uh, or the edge of the pavement extended out. We could put that double large arrow across the way. I heard that mentioned. We could add a stop sign to the left-hand side. Um, we could add a stop line or a stop bar. And if you remember from the webinar, this stop line would be four to 30 feet from the intersecting roadway, placed where you actually want the traffic to stop with the best visibility and where no one's gonna clip the front of this vehicle as they turn in left. The stop sign typically would be six to 12 feet from the intersecting roadway in a rural area. Uh, but it could be up to 50 feet for a wide throat T intersection. We saw that as well. And then in addition, I've added retroreflective strips to the signpost. And that's something that is given as an option for increasing or enhancing the visibility of your signs. The retroreflective strip is going to, for the most part, match the background color of the sign. So the stop signs is red with the double large arrow, it's yellow. We heard the stop ahead mentioned. Yeah, you could do the stop aheads. You could also put the retroreflective strips on the signpost. You could put the words on the pavement, stop ahead. You could also put the word stop up there um, at the stop bar or the stop line as well. And that stop ahead sign is an option, if you recall, unless you can't see that stop sign far enough away to come to a safe stop. And that was given to us by the stop in sight distance, 55 miles an hour, that's 495 feet. Again, some items, I think we covered this, we did cover this in the, the webinar series. Other options, the MUTCD allows transverse rumbles. You know, so if none of those others are working, then you might consider transverse rumbles. Now these would be white or the color of the pavement, so they could be thermal pat thermoplastic preformed thermo like we have here. They could also be mailed in, uh, but these are really good at alerting the driver. Someone mentioned striping. Yes, we can spot stripe anywhere where lane assignment is considered needed or necessary. So that means at intersections, hills, curves, you could use LED signs that would also work. And we could use intersection warning signs. So in this particular case on the road that stopped, we could put these out to let people know there's a T intersection coming up. On the road that didn't stop, if there was limited sight distance or as an option, if we had an issue with crashes, we could install the side road sign to let them know that there's a side road coming up. Uh, that would be the, the side road sign. And underneath it, we could put an advisory speed or the road name that's coming up, advanced road name, either one. 
if we use the advisory speed, typically that would be based upon the available site distance. But that is a May condition, the side road sign. And those were the, the two questions that we had from the registration. And I want to cover just a couple from part one, and then we'll see what kind of questions you have. So here's one of those from part one. Someone actually asked me, if you remember in the introduction, I told you that I was the current reigning champion of the annual traffic cone toss, and I was a second generation skunk whisperer. And so if you want to know more about that, ask me. So that question was presented in the first webinar. It said, how did the first generation of skunk whisperers begin? That's a little bit about my backstory. We're leaving the MUTCD for just a second, but just a little bit of the backstory. My parents are, thank goodness, still, still alive, still healthy, still live on a farm, and they have a large garden. In this large garden, they have trouble sometimes with all kinds of animals or creatures that come in and they like to eat part of the garden. Well, one of the things that they have that come in are skunks. And my father is tasked with removing the skunks. Now, my mother doesn't want the skunks hurt. So he has to live trap the skunk, capture the skunk in a trap, and then take that skunk while it's in this live trap carry it to another farm that they own several miles away and then release it on this farm without getting sprayed. And he has developed a method for doing so. So he's able to trap this and then he's able to um, approach the skunk after it's trapped, after it's in the cage, load it up onto the back of his truck and haul it to the other farm without getting sprayed. Now, I can't give away all the secrets, but this does involve using a tarpaulin or a tarp that once it goes dark they are much calmer it also involves whistling softly or humming softly that gentle noise uh, with a with a soft voice seems to also calm the skunks and then again being very gentle very slow with the movements with this particular method with what he's developed he's been able to relocate dozens of skunks over the years and so it's a trait that I'm having to learn or a skill that I'm having to learn that makes me a second generation skunk whisperer. And the whispering part comes as you're talking to them, as you're loading them up so that you're calming them down with your voice. They're not as scared. All right, so that's the skunk whisperer. Uh, now let's move back to the MUTCD. The question came in, please confirm the MUTCD must be met for private parking lots. Um, so that is not exactly what I said or what I meant to say. The MUTCD applies to all roads open to public travel, and that includes private roads, uh, unless they're a gated community or something of that nature. But it does exclude the parking spots and the aisles that connect them. But everything else has to meet it. So, for example, if I had a, let's say, a Walmart and a Lowe's that were side by side in the same development, those uh, roads that are connecting Walmart, Lowe's, and then going out to the main road, even though that's private, may be owned by a private developer, that has to follow the MUTCD. Again, the only thing that is an exception are the parking spots and the aisles that connect them. Now, this comes out of 1A.07 of the MUTCD, and it says in there that gives you a CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, that adopts the MUTCD as a national standard for all traffic control devices installed on any street, highway, bikeway, or private road open to public travel. And then it encourages you to see the definition in section 1A.13. And that's something that I would encourage you to do as well from a legal standpoint is anytime you see a word or a phrase in the MUTCD and you're not sure what it means, look it up. In part one, there is a full list of definitions. So let's go there and look up that particular definition, private road open to public travel. When you look that definition up, uh, it says private road open to public travel. That's private toll roads, roads, any adjacent sidewalks within shopping centers, airports, sports arenas, etc. that are privately owned but where the public is allowed to travel without restriction. 
does give you an exception for gated communities uh, where access is restricted at all times, parking areas, driving areas within, driving aisles within the parking areas. So that's where that came from. All the um, roads that are within that shopping center, including the sidewalks, have to meet the METCD. The only exceptions are the parking areas and the driving aisles within those parking areas. Otherwise, it has to conform to the MUTCD. And let's see, that was four. Let's do number five, and then we'll, I'll ask Kristen what kind of questions we have. And again, we have plenty more that we can look at, but we do want to give you a, a chance to ask questions as well. So the fifth one here is, can you repeat the county road requirements to follow MUTCD criteria? And the answer is, we just read that from section 1A.07, all roads open to public travel have to follow the METCD. So county roads must meet the METCD requirements, just like all the other roads that are open to public travel. But I think what this question was talking about, because it was in part one, is it was probably referring to part five that I mentioned. So in the METCD, there are nine chapters total, or nine parts. Part five deals with just low volume county roads. And it gives you some extra information for just low volume county roads. Now, the reason I say that is check out the definition. This is part five, and it talks about a low volume road for this part of the manual, just in part five, is defined as follows. Shall be a facility line outside the built up areas of cities, towns, and communities. Okay, so now I'm thinking, we're talking about rural roads. Uh, shall have a traffic volume of less than 400 average annual data traffic. Should not be a freeway, expressway, et cetera. A road on a designated state highway system. So if you're talking about a rural road that's not on the state highway system, well, you're talking about low volume county roads or maybe low volume private roads that are in that rural area. Although it says also residential street in a neighborhood, et cetera, is also not using this part of the manual. But anyway, so that there is a special section of the manual to answer the question for low volume county roads, county roads that have less than 480T average annual daily traffic and that are in the rural area, there is a special part, part five. As far as meeting all the METCD, yeah, county roads have to definitely do that. Okay, so that's a few of the questions that we received that we didn't get to. Kristen, how about questions that we've received today? Yeah, we do have a few questions that have come in. So the first one here says, uh, when you have sh uh, pavement that is grooved and striping is placed on that roof for better visibility for night driving and rainy weather, are those grooves also there to get your attention if you start to leave the travel? Yeah, so it's a great question. We're, we're talking about recessed longitudinal pavement markings, I think would be the, the correct engineering quote unquote term to use for that. But essentially we mill a groove and then we place the stripe down in that groove. And there's the reason, as you said, is one for visibility, nighttime visibility uh, in areas. I know they're doing that where I live because we do a lot of snow plowing. And that also helps preserve the pavement marking so that the snow plows don't take it up. You know, they don't actually scrape it off the roadway and it last longer because of that. So the question is, do those grooves also help with lateral positioning of the vehicle? The answer to that is, I believe it would because it couldn't do otherwise. I mean, it's a groove right there. So you're going to feel that little bit of a groove as well. Is that the intended purpose? Um, the answer is no, not really. I mean, the, really the intended purpose is just to help with longevity of that stripe and visibility of the stripe. That's really the intended purpose why it was designed. The fact that you also get that little bit of uh, tactile feeling, the little bit of vibration, knowing that, you, that you're leaving your lane, that's just an added bonus. Next question, Kristen. 
All right, excellent. Uh, next one is talking about the bike lanes. So what is the preferable maximum uh, lane width for a lane uh, for non-buffered bike lane? I'm sorry. Uh, what is the preferable maximum width for a non-buffered bike lane? Great question. And the uh, preferable width when you read the AASHTO guidelines is five feet to the best of my memory. So something I didn't look up, of course, beforehand, but I have studied that before. So five feet, I believe, is the preferable width. If you don't have room for that, uh, then you could take it down to four. But when you get much less than four, you know, there are some other there are some other things that need to be considered. But five feet, that would be the, the desirable width. Next question, please. All right. Yeah, very good. We got one more. And so this one is saying, when you are changing ownership and maintenance responsibilities of a roadway, what is the responsibility of the municipality of the sign? Is If the sign has previous municipality as their inventory, is there a policy? So I'm, I'm uh, trying to wrap my mind around the question there. Um, maybe I think what they're what you're saying is, let's say that we have a road that belonged to the city, to the municipality, and you've transferred ownership to, let's say, the state. The, the DOT decided to, they needed that roadway, they wanted to add it to their system, and you've decided to do that. Or what uh, more commonly happens in some areas is there'll be a private developer that builds a subdivision, and then once it's completed, once all the lots are sold, at some point, that subdivision gets transferred to the city or the county for ownership. And the question is, is there any kind of uh, requirements on that person that owned it before to continue to maintain it? I think is what I'm hearing. And the answer to that is, first off, I'm not an attorney, so really you're getting into a little bit more of a legal matter, a legal issue. Uh, but I would say that when we, as a DOT, took over a roadway, and we did that not too often, but occasionally we would. We would take over a roadway. As soon as we assumed control of that roadway and we adopted it into our system and we added it to our inventory, well, at that point, we were responsible for whatever was out there. Now, within a reasonable amount of time, if that was substandard, within a reasonable amount of time, we should bring that up to standard. And so that, that reasonable amount of time would have been up to the attorneys to decide. And I think the same would be true for you as a city if you adopted a street that was uh, maybe built by a private developer, you would have a, a reasonable amount of time to bring that up to MUTCD compliance. But once you adopted it, that would be on you, not on them. With that being said, though, that's why we would strongly encourage you through planning and zoning to have requirements that made sure that whatever they installed actually met the MUTCD, that that was incorporated into those planning and zoning requirements. And that's what we always encouraged our local agencies to do as well that were within our, our highway district. Yeah, great question. Well, let's have... Our, uh, yes. So, Kristen, okay, you want to go ahead. More no. we well, we got more? one more, but let's go ahead and get a few of the other questions, and then we'll get some more from the audience in a little bit. Okay. All right. Sounds great. We'll, we'll do four or five more of these, and then we'll go back to the audience questions. Here's the next uh, question. And again, this comes down to leg legality sum. It says, if a PE chooses to not apply a standard, which is mandatory for the MUTCD, doesn't he or she take on considerable more liability should the change result in a crash or an accident? Um, and the answer to that is you are correct in that a standard is something that is required. It's uh, mandatory. It has that verb shall in it. But we do have this statement, and I think this is where the question came from is when I mentioned this. This is in 1A.09, talking about an engineering study and uh, engineering judgment. When we come down here to revision one, paragraph three, 
it says the decision to use a particular device at a particular location should be made on the basis of either an engineering study or the application of engineering judgment. Thus, while this manual provides standards, et cetera, uh, this manual should not be considered a substitute for engineering judgment. And engineering judgment should be exercised in the selection, application, as well as the location design, et cetera. This particular paragraph, notice it says revision one. Um, this particular paragraph was not in the original version of the 2009 MUTCD. It had been in previous versions or something similar to it had been, but it was removed. And when that was removed, there was a huge outcry from the engineering community. And it said, you know, not every situation is the same. We always try to follow the standards whenever possible, but occasionally there are situations where it is safer not to or not to apply that particular standard in our opinion or our judgment. And we do, really don't want to be held to that. We want to be allowed to use our judgment to make the best case or the best situation for the public to make it as safe as practical. Given that large outcry, there was this added back in as a revision to the 2009. So revision one added this particular paragraph back in. And again, I'm not an attorney, but what I have been told by the attorneys is that this particular paragraph gives engineers, a professional engineer, a lot of leeway. And I've been told that often we underestimate our engineering judgment or the way it's uh, presented in court. So with all that being said, the question says, if I decide not to apply a standard, don't I take on a lot more liability? So I wouldn't say liability because liability is a legal obligation to pay monetary damages. That's the official definition of it. But you would you will take on the responsibility to explain your actions. So that is, and your actions need to be something that a court would deem reasonable at that point. So what you open yourself up to is exposure. You know, so that's one of the reasons we follow the standards, if at all possible. And if you're a non-engineer, if you don't have engineering judgment, then you follow the standard. There's no leeway. But if you are, then there is a little bit of leeway. But what it opens you up to is potential liability, but definitely more scrutiny, a lot more scrutiny of that decision. And you need to be willing and prepared to defend yourself. In other words, uh, you would never not follow the standard unless you had a very good reason. That reason was well documented, uh, written, and you were willing to defend yourself potentially in a court of law. And so that's my non-attorney advice for you. Again, seek the advice of a counsel if you're ever in that situation or you want to find out more about that. Here's the second question for this section. Could you speak to urban public parking signs and their colors? Yeah, absolutely. So this is covered in section 2B.46 of the MUTCD. And there in paragraphs three and four, it talks about the colors for those parking. Uh, if it is, if parking is prohibited, then it's going to be red and white. So a red colors, red words, red legend for those symbols on a white background. Uh, there are some exceptions, though, that allow black. For some cases, there's black on white. Again, we're talking about regulatory parking prohibited. If it is only prohibited part of the time or it's a limited parking situation um, or, you know, just during certain hours, then we're going to have white on or sorry, green on white, green letters, green legend on a white background. And that indicates the permissiveness of those signs, maybe limited restrictions. To give you an example of that, you know, this is figure 2B-24 from that same section. And you can see the red on white, you know, that is uh, talking about something that's prohibited, no parking, loading zone, no parking, bus stop. But when we're talking about maybe one hour pay parking, now we're looking at green on white. But that's the section I would go to is 2B.46, and you can see all kinds of information about the parking. 
question, uh, the next question is, are there codes for low speed residential roads that would typically have cars parked on the roadway? And by codes, I think they're talking about laws, ordinances, regulations. For example, there may be curves in the road, but it's only 20 or 25 miles per hour with driveways over 30 to 50 feet, or even more frequently in the example of a townhome community, but the agency is asking for curve signs as if it were a different road situation. So really, I think the question is, can we install curve warning signs in locations that didn't meet the, um, the requirements in section 2C.06, or you know, they really didn't fit that chart table 2C-5 that we spoke of. Well, let me uh, give you some guidance on that. In 2C.06 of the METCD, paragraph two, it said, in advance of horizontal curves on freeways, expressways, roads that have over a thousand average annual daily traffic that are classified as arterials or collectors. And remember, that's the functional classification. Arterials are main arteries from one large city to another. Uh, collectors are, they take all the traffic from the local roads and they funnel it to the arterials. And by the way, these are loose definitions. If you want the exact definition, you can find that in part one of the METCD, but then everything else are the local roads. And that's what we're talking about here. So this particular standard is not talking about this residential street, low speed residential street that the individual is asking about. So then we come down to paragraph three, option, horizontal alignment warning signs, curve warning signs may also be used on other roadways um, or on arterials or collectors with less than 1000 ADT based on engineering judgment. So what this is saying is that we can, the standard given in paragraph two, that's when we're required to install that curve warning signage. And this also had that compliance date of December 31st, 2019. Down here, this paragraph says, yeah, that paragraph two, that's when it's required. Paragraph three, but based on engineering judgment, you can use it on other roadways. So my question or my answer to this question is, are there codes? Well, the METCD addresses it. And the METCD has adopted a state law, so I guess technically you could say it's a code, but it says that on this particular situation, based on engineering judgment, you could install curve warning signage. But when would I do that? Well, I might do that if there was a demonstrated need. Let's say that I know people are having trouble navigating that curve. Then I could buy crash data or something of that nature then I could install that curve warning, or in this case, a turn warning sign. When we do that, typically, what I would call the standard of practice is, we would follow table 2C-5. You know, we would still go out there and determine what's the maximum safe advisory speed for this particular situation coming up. And then based upon the difference between the speed limit and that advisory speed, then we would put in the required signage, but what if the speed limit's 20 and you determine, yeah, they can actually take this curve at 25? What do you do in that situation? Well, the answer is, if you have a demonstrated crash history, that means people are still having trouble navigating it. Maybe they're going faster than the speed limit and it would still be, again, it's based on engineering judgment, but it still be, might be a good idea to put up, um, at the very least, a turn warning sign just to let the public know that it's coming. But in that case, it's not a requirement or a recommendation, not a shall or a should. It would be something that's optional based on engineering judgment, as you see in paragraph three. We'll do one more question, then we'll see what questions you have. Uh, this one came in and said, where do you install the type three object marker OM3-C? And if you remember the type three object markers, there were four object markers given, four types, type one, two, and three. The type three object markers though, they were for obstructions adjacent to or within the roadway. So on the sides of the road, 
on the right or left side of the roadway or within the roadway itself. And that's where you use the OM3-C is for obstructions within the roadway. 2C.64 paragraph 4 gives this to us. It says, if traffic can pass to either side of the obstruction, the alternating black and retroreflective yellow stripe shall form chevrons at point upwards, the OM3-C. And the photo on the right, I had to search a little bit. I was looking for um, something that's in the middle of the roadway on maybe a residential street, but I had trouble finding a picture of that. This came to mind, so I grabbed this one. This would be like an exit ramp on the interstate. Maybe you can visualize that. And we have a gore area, and this is a crash cushion. So with this exit ramp on the interstate, we have traffic, the main part of the interstate going to the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have the traffic uh, going onto the exit ramp. So in that case, the sticker that they have placed on here is an om 3 dash <clears throat> C. And when I have seen this used on a residential city street is think about an underpass. And with this underpass, maybe you have two lanes of traffic going east. And right in the middle of it, you have a pier. You know, maybe it's an old railroad structure and there's a pier right there in the middle of it. And so now your two lanes that are going east, both going the same direction, they're splitting around this pier in the middle. That's another situation where you might use the OM3-C, and I've seen that before, uh, but I couldn't find a picture of it right away to show you. All right, so that's a few more of the questions we received from the training. Kristen, what about today? Do we have more questions to address? All right, yeah, we did have one that came in. It says, uh, can you discuss the legality or appropriateness of installing warning signs that are not specifically shown in the MUTCD? So for example, um, a narrow road sign that's not a standard sign. So is it acceptable to use a non-standard MUTCD sign if it's deemed appropriate or beneficial to use? It's a great question. And the answer is, um, Generally speaking, no, but the in the first part of the MUTCD, there is a paragraph, and I'm trying to pull it up in my mind's eye of exactly what it does say, but what it, this particular paragraph that is in part one, it gives agencies the ability to develop certain word messages, is the way it's phrased, for warning the public about what's coming up. So if the DOT or the city or the county, they wanted to sit down with their staff, with their engineering staff, and develop a word message that was different than something we found in the MUTCD. Um, as long as it was needed, you know, as necessary, it was warning the public about a situation coming up. Um, and again, a warning sign, word message, something that wasn't confusing to the motorist, then they could do that. And agencies do that quite a bit, DOTs, I'm sorry, do that quite a bit. When you go to the Florida DOT website, uh, you can find signs that the Florida DOT has created word messages. Ones that I've seen before, um, for example, out west, they have flash floods, sometimes in the canyons, and they'll make signs that are specifically talking about those flash flood situations that they have out there um, for those those canyons. I have seen uh, South Carolina, for example, the South Carolina DOT has a sign that says deaf child. And that's something that their engineering staff has decided to create. And so I guess the answer to that, ask an engineer a simple question, you get a long answer. My daughters say that to me every now and then. By the way, if you want a short answer, just put that in the question. So just give me a yes or no. But my daughters all the time tell me, they say, does every question have to come with a lecture? And I said, yeah, I'm an engineer. That's the answer I'm going to give you. Unless you would like a shorter answer, then tell me you want the shorter answer and I'll give it to you. But anyway, the long and short of that is, generally speaking, no, but there is a paragraph in part one that allows agencies to develop certain word messages and i want to encourage you to read that paragraph for a bit more guidance but 
you could, in some situations, develop your own word messages. All right. Any other All right, questions? Excellent. Yeah, we do. We have a hand raised. Someone wants to ask a question. So, Sarah, I've just unmuted you if you want to unmute and ask your question. And then we've got two more that just got um, put into the chat. Um, so, Sarah, you should be able to click the unmute button and speak. Looks like you're still muted. All right, so while she's figuring that out, let me go to one of the other questions that were typed in here, um, Todd. So this person says that they see cones that are different colors besides orange and white. So is that something that's allowed? The answer is no, not for traffic control. When you read that particular section, it's uh, part six of the METCD and it's um, 6F. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but when it, there is in 6F, it talks about channelizing devices, and those are cones, drums, barricades, et cetera. When it talks about cones, and you go to that particular section, it'll say the standard is the predominant color of the cone shall be orange. And the reason it says that is that at night, we're required to have those white retroreflective strips on it. But uh, yeah, the predominant color of the cone shall be orange. That means blue cones, lime green ones, all these that you see, they don't use, they don't meet the standard for temporary traffic control and should not be used for those. The only time you might use those is perhaps to mark utility within the work zone itself. So for example, if I'm closing the lane, channelizing traffic, those are gonna be orange, but maybe I've got a overhead power line and I wanna to note to the construction trucks, the dump trucks that are traveling, through there for my internal traffic control plan, I want to note that there's an overhead power line. I might use it then, but otherwise, they've got to be orange. All right, very good. And uh, another question, so this one's a little bit long. So a pedestrian warning sign with a 45 degree down arrow was placed for a pedestrian crossing. Uh, due to utility conflict, how far can it be placed ahead of the crossing or behind the crossing? Ooh, yeah, that is a, uh, a good question as well. The, so what they're talking about is the pedestrian warning sign. That's a diamond shape warning sign. And then it's supposed to have a downward diagonal arrow, the plaque underneath it. And typically that is placed at the um, location of the crosswalk itself. So right there, so the public knows that's where it's at. Um, but now they have a utility conflict, so they have to move it. And that is something I think would be up to engineering judgment as far as how far. In other words, we want to keep it fairly close to its traditional location. But if utilities are a problem, then yeah, I think we could move that and we could adjust that location. But I would say keep it as close as you can. So if you have to move it 10 feet, uh, then move it 10 feet. And I would rather see it before you get to the crosswalk rather than afterwards, because you don't want to see that. I'm immediately looking for the um, crosswalk itself. So I wouldn't want to see it after the crosswalk. I'd want to see it personally beforehand. So as far as how much, I don't think that's given as far as how much, I think it would be based upon engineering judgment. And I would say just put it as close as you can. All right, very good. Uh, let's get back to some of the questions that you have in the presentation, Todd. All right, sounds great. Let's see the next one. These are from part two. And this one says, what problems or liabilities can occur when politicians force staff to install stop signs where they're not warranted? For example, speed control by making a four-way stop where one street is clearly the higher traffic street all right so what they're they're discussing here is this comes from section 2b.07 and this is where we talked about a multi-way stop so maybe all legs on this intersection stop and i told you that multi-way stop control is used where the volume of traffic on the intersecting roads is approximately equal and they're saying okay we know that but uh, we got some politicians that they've told us they wanted a four-way stop, so that's why we're making it, even though they're not equal. 
So what problems or liabilities could occur? If So one of the problems could be for using stop signs where they're not warranted is you begin to get people that disregard the stop sign. So in other words, if I come up and the road that has 3,000 vehicles a day stops and there's a cross road that has 500, so 3,000 versus 500, and I'm coming up here all the time and there's never anybody from the side streets, you know, eventually you may have people that just sort of roll through that stop sign. And that's not a good thing, but that could happen. People are very perceptive about figuring out when they need to stop. And that means that uh, you could have crashes there that may rise, but overall, you could have a disregard for stop signs in general. So that's one of the problems, making that 3000 vehicle city street stop could also lead to an increase in rear end collisions. So it could actually um, increase those type of crashes. Liabilities, um, you know, there's always a potential for liability. And in my opinion, that would increase the exposure for the liability. Whenever we were, occasionally we were asked to do something like that. And whenever we were, I would just make sure to take copious notes. I would also record any kind of uh, emails or anything like that. You know, first off, I would, I would ask for that request in writing. And I'm talking about me personally. When I worked at the DOT, I would say, well, I need you to give that to me in writing from you. And then I kept that. You know, I didn't just keep the email file hanging around somewhere. I printed that out. I put that into the file, um, kept copious notes. Uh, if I if I had told them and I always did tell them, well, that doesn't really follow the guidelines or how we normally do it, then I would have those as well. But that's the best way to minimize your exposure should something happen and you get potentially sued. This next question is also about the multi-way stops. And it says, section 2B.07 says, multi-way stop control is used where those intersecting roadways are approximately equal in volume. However, it also goes on to give you volume warrants. If remember that we did that in part two, and it says, does it mean that you can't do a multi-way stop sign if those minimum volumes are not met, even if the volumes are roughly equal. So what they're saying is they, they have a, let's say a residential situation where you have very low traffic volumes or you have low traffic volumes and you're not meeting these minimums. Can I do a multi-way stop anyway, or would that be wrong? And the answer to that is found by looking a little bit deeper into that section because in the webinar series, you know, we didn't have time to go deep, deep into it, but this was section 2B.07. And that's where you had the, the sentence that says, multi-way stop control is used for the volume of traffic on the intersecting roadways are approximately equal. Um, and then it goes on to say, the decision should be based on an engineering study. So let's just put that out there. First off, we're gonna be doing an engineering study. Now, you want to look that word up too to make sure that you're meeting that. An engineering study, when you look that up, is defined as a study that is done by an engineer or under the direction of an engineer, and it's a written study. So it means you're going to look at the situation, every situation is different, and you're going to study that. Now, these criteria should be considered in that study, and this is what we were talking about. You had three different conditions. Each one of these, condition A, B, or C, would help it to meet the warrants or the give you justification or the reason to install that multi-way stop. And the one mentioned here was minimum volumes, but it could also have been based upon crashes or inner measure for traffic control signals. But what if you don't meet C1 and C2? That's really the question. Well, then we go down to paragraph five. Paragraph five says, other criteria that may be considered in an engineering study include, you know, the need to control left turn conflicts, um, need to control vehicle pedestrian conflicts, near locations that have high pedestrian volumes, or check out D here. And I think this answers the question 
that was uh, put in. An intersection of two residential neighborhood collector through streets of similar design and operating characteristics where a multi-way stop control would improve traffic operational characteristics of the intersection. So what this is saying is if you had the minimum volumes, then that's definitely saying it's warranted. You know, that decision is made for you as far as is it warranted or not? Yes, it meets warrants. Now you get to decide whether you would suggest the four-way stop for it or not. But even if it doesn't meet warrants, you could come down here to these other options. And if you believe, based on your engineering judgment, that it's going to operate better, it's going to uh, function better, either for carrying traffic or uh, for crashes, then you could also use it on roads that didn't meet the minimum volumes. Yeah. So the answer to the question is, yes, you could use that on residential local streets that didn't meet those minimum volumes, but that would need to be discussed and described in your engineering study because that's a should condition, something you should do. The next question is, and we'll answer this one, Kristen, and then we'll see what we have. Um, so how is the distance measured as a crow flies or the actual distance? And this question came right about the time date stamp that we were talking about the stopping site distance. And if you remember earlier, we had the stop ahead sign and we said that stop ahead sign is a may condition unless you can't see the stop sign far enough away to come to a safe stop. And at 55 miles an hour, that was 495 feet. So the question was, is that 495 feet as a crow flies or the actual distance? And the reason for that is when I gave it to you, there was a curve in the roadway. And the answer to that is it would be the actual distance traveled on the pavement. Because that's actually the whole distance that you would have to stop. And if you would like to you know, get a little bit more verification of that, you can get the Federal Highway Administration's vegetation, for, vegetation Control for Safety booklet. And then there, in there, it talks about site distance on the inside of a curve and what's needed there. And when we measure that, we measure around the curve because that's the whole distance that the public would have to stop. So that's this entire distance, not measured as the crow flies for that 495 feet. All right, so Kristen, how about other questions? Do we have other questions? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. Um, so we've got questions about automated RRFBs. Um, so in general, and I guess this is looking at the, the FDM, so in general, the pavement markings include uh, a stop bar. So um, is it kind of your understanding that, you know, with a stop bar there, I mean, if there's no pedestrians, then they would just kind of like go past that. And if there are, they, they would stop. Does that, um, you know, kind of mislead people to just kind of going over a stop bar without stopping? Any thoughts on that? So the RRFD, that's the rapid rectangular flashing beacons, and those are activated, you're correct, uh, you know, when the pedestrians come, and that's when you would have to stop. So I guess my, my thoughts on that are, um, yeah, that I could see how that that might be, it might lead to individuals not a, maybe disregarding those stop lines at some point, because you're, you are correct when those aren't flashing and there's no pedestrians present, then you just drive right through. But we never use a stop line by itself though. So I don't think it's that big of an issue because if I have a T intersection like we showed earlier and we have that stop line, that is a supplement or in addition to the stop sign. You know, the stop sign is the, the primary device that's letting the public know that there is a need to stop. And then the stop line is just indicating to the public, here's where we actually need you to stop. It's, uh, you could think about it in the same context as a traffic control signal. With a traffic control signal, we have stop lines and people are used to that. That's just saying that when this light is red, here's where you need to stop. And so I guess, let me back up on my answer a little bit. I really don't think it's an issue or a problem because we have those all the time with traffic control signals. 
you know, because there, again, that stop line doesn't say you need to stop. It says when you need to stop, when that traffic light is red, here's where you need to stop at. Otherwise, just go right over the top of it. And so as I'm thinking these questions out loud, I'm going to say, yeah, I don't think there's any confusion because it's really no different than a, a traffic signal. All right, very good. Uh, another question that we have here, it's kind of long. I'm going to try to paraphrase. So hopefully I um, get this correct. So at a signalized intersection um, and you've got a right turn onto a minor road, um, can you combine that with like a bike lane and, and turn it into a share row or should you really be trying to keep those uh, separate? Uh, that is um, covered in the MUTCD and when they show that they want to keep those separate so you're it even has the uh, striping pattern for that right turn lane so the um, the bike lane will continue just to the right of the travel lane all right so the bike lane will continue just to the right of the travel lane and then the right turn lane will be on the outside of it and there will be a break in the bike lane the bike lane lines will go to dash at that point to allow that right turn movement into the or that change of lanes into the right turn lane and that's actually something that you know at this point i might be able to go to and and show you that i think i can put my my mouse or my cursor on that fairly fast because chapter nine is not that large i think i can find it fairly quickly and show you actually a picture of what i'm talking about here we go. So if I had in this particular diagram, this is from the MUTCD, it's uh, figure 9C-1, and it's an example of intersection pavement markings, designated bike lanes. And so here we have a right turn lane and the bike lane. And so it shows the bike lane stays to the right of that travel lane. And then you have the right turn lane that is on the other side of it. And then there is a change in the striping pattern to indicate to the public that they can get over. And the same thing with the left turn lane. The bike lane again stays, um, if, it, if they're gonna be turning left, it would stay over here to the left of the through lane, and then the left turn lane would be outside of it. It's a great question. Uh, do you wanna take others, Kristen, or do you wanna go back to the presentation? Yeah, let's go back to the presentation and then we'll grab a few uh, more a little bit later. Also, uh, the offer still stands. If anyone wants to unmute and ask Todd a question, just raise your hand and we can do that. All right, so the, this question came in and it says, which would be considered safer for viewing, post standing signage or markings on the roadway? And this is something that is gonna be my opinion. So it's not written down as far as the MUTCD is concerned, the MUTCD discusses both, but my thoughts are the post standing signage. And the reason primarily is they're easier to see in inclement weather. A lot of times our pavement markings, when it is raining hard and it's dark at night, they'll lose their retroreflective properties because they get covered up with the rainwater. And you, you may have noticed that at night during a rainstorm, a lot of times the uh, pavement markings seem to disappear or they get very, very faint. That's when the, the post standing signage would be much better. So easier to see in inclement weather in other states where they have snow and ice, that is especially the case because those pavement markings quickly become covered up with snow and ice. So for example, in Colorado or even in uh, Northern Kentucky where I live off or Kentucky where I live most, most of the time in the wintertime, there'll be days when you can't see the pavement markings for the snow and ice. They also have a longer lifespan in most cases. Another question we had was, when do we use the type two object marker? So where there were four different types of object markers, type one, two, and three. And when do you use the type two object marker? Well, the guidance given is for obstructions adjacent to the roadway. And that's to mark or delineate that obstruction so the public can see it and they know it's there, they can shy away from it. Now that is, when we look in the AASHTO Roadside Design Guide, so now we're going outside the METCD, but AASHTO, the American Association, State Highway Transportation Officials, they publish a roadside design guide. And there it says, 
Actually, the best option is to remove it. It gives you six preferences for items, fixed object hazards that might be within that clear zone measured from the edge of the roadway out. And the first option would be to remove it. So let's take this box that I have here. This is a box. It's got a wall on the back of it. Um, when this piece of concrete is sticking up higher than four inches, four inches is a maximum stub height of anything that's considered a fixed object, non-crashworthy, and this large piece of concrete definitely is. Uh, when we have this, ideally, the best solution would be to remove it. Take this down below the four inch line. But way on down the list, number six is to mark it or delineate it. And this is when you could use a type two object marker. You could also use the type three for obstructions adjacent to or within the roadway. So it means I would use one of these type threes. And I'm curious about that. In the question box, if instead of the type two, if I used one of these type threes, which one would I use in this particular situation? Would it be the L, the C, or the R? Just give you a little bit of a quiz over what we talked about in the uh, SBMM series, uh, METCD series. So what do you think? Would it be the L, the C, or the R if I used a type three instead of this one? All right, well, I've got a few responses here and I've got most people are saying R. I've got a couple L's, but mostly R. And you are correct. Yeah, it would be the OM3-R. Yeah, those stripes would be sloping from the upper right down to the lower left. And that's what we would use if we didn't use the Type 2. Now, the Type 2 could be three delineator buttons, vertically, horizontally, or this strip of yellow retroreflective material that you see either vertically or horizontally. And there was another question similar, another question about the Type 2s. It asked, is the striped reflective tape required for guardrail uh, in treatments, or is the yellow retroreflective material acceptable? So what they're asking is, can we or could we use the type two for guardrail in treatment, or uh, is the type three object marker, is that required? And the answer to that, per the MUTCD, now, you also, in addition, remember you had the METCD, that's the bare minimum. But in addition to that, you have the Florida DOT design standards, the Florida Green Book, et cetera. And I didn't go through those, but per the MUTCD, either one of these would be okay. But then you may have additional guidelines. You need to look at those and make sure nothing else is more restrictive. But per the METCD, if it's adjacent to the roadway, it could be the type two or the type three. And that's what you see here. This agency is meeting the METCD guidelines by having the solid yellow sticker on the end of this guardrail end treatment. All right, that was part two. Then we move on to part three. And I mentioned a while ago the Florida Green Book. And so when we um, look at the Florida Green Book, it's a manual of uniform minimum standards for design, construction, maintenance of streets and highways. And really it's, it's intended for use as I read the foreword of it for any of those items, design, construction or maintenance on off state highway systems. So it's really talking about cities and county streets or private roads, things that aren't state highways. That's really where this is. And that's a great question because I hadn't thought about looking into the Florida Green Book. The reason this question was asked is because when we talked about your stripes, your center line stripes or your edge lines, I told you that the MUTCD would allow four to six inch width stripes. And as you look around the nation, different people fall in different camps. For example, Georgia, the Georgia DOT uses a five inch stripe. They go right in the middle. Others will use six inch on interstate parkway and four inch on other roads. But this question says, what about the Florida Green Book? And the answer is, you're exactly right. Whoever submitted that, I appreciate you sharing that and giving us a chance to touch on that. When you look at the Florida Green Book, it does say six inch pavement markings should be used for all pavement, center line, lane separation line, and edge line markings. 
So that answers the question is, you're exactly right. Yes, and that would be the uh, guidance given, the recommendation per the Florida Green Book of a six inch wide stripe. Now, that actually makes really good sense considering, you know, in other words, it doesn't, uh, considering the user population in Florida is a little bit older perhaps than in some other states, the average user on the roadway. And as we age, our vision begins to decline. And so using a wider stripe for visibility, especially at night, it's a great idea. So I, I can 100% get behind it and see the need for it. And I appreciate whoever mentioned that for bringing it up. The next one is, how about center lines with no edge lines if there's a curb? Can we do that? Well, this is mentioned under the warrants for the use of edge lines. This is section 3B.07, and it tells us when edge lines are required. Freeways, expressways, rural arterials gives us width. It also gives us when they're recommended, um, when edge lines are recommended. Then, as we come on down here, it does mention curbs. It gives us some options. Uh, edge lines may be placed on streets and highways with or without center line markings. And it says edge lines may be excluded based on engineering judgment for reasons such as if the travelway edges are already delineated by curbs. So the question is, how about center lines with no edge lines if there's a curb? The answer is paragraph 5, section 3B.07 says, based upon engineering judgment, you could eliminate the edge line if you have the curbs. But again, that'd be an engineering judgment decision, but that option is definitely given to do so. The next question deals with retroreflectivity. And it's talking about retroreflectivity. If you remember September of 2022, there was revision three to the 2009 MUTCD. And there we had those minimum retroreflectivity requirements given for some of our uh, pavement markings. And so the question is, is that minimum retroreflectivity, the 50, the minimum for Sharrows and other markings? And the answer is, um, it did not apply to the Sharrows. That's the quick answer. But here's where we find that. Section 3A.03 tells us that we have to have a method to maintain the minimum retroreflectivity at that 50 um, millicandles per square meter per lux or candelas under dry conditions for longitudinal markings on roadways with speed limits of 35 or greater. So we're talking about longitudinal markings. A Sharrow would technically be a transverse mark marking. Also, it goes on to say these markings may be excluded. Markings on streets or highways that have an ADT of less than 6,000. So first off, um, the speed limit, in order to have to meet that requirement, we need to be 35 or greater. And you can exclude streets that have less than 6,000. So really, it's 35 miles per hour greater, 6,000 or more vehicles. But we can also exclude uh, curb markings, parking space markings, shared use path markings. Sharrows would, would fall into that. And also goes on to say, the provisions of this section do not apply to non launch shooting pavement markings, including but not limited to transverse markings, word symbols, etc. Really, boil all that down, this new requirement of 50 is really just talking about your longitudinal striping, your center lines and your edge lines on roads that are 35 or more speed limit and have 6,000 or more vehicles a day. Otherwise, you don't have a qualitative, sorry, a quantitative requirement. Now, what do I mean by that? This 50 millicandelas per square meter per lux, that's an actual measure. We can take a device and measure that. So we would call that a quantitative requirement. So only on those longitudinal stripes. These other things, these other items, the transverse markings, words, symbols, et cetera, on the pavement, 
um, they don't have an exact number, but they do have a qualitative requirement. It just says that when we install them, they shall be retroreflective. So they have to have reflective properties, and we just don't know how much because it doesn't give us an exact number. But they still still require it to be reflective. There's just no quantitative minimum for those. All right, let's. Um, I have a few more questions, but Kristen, do you have any that you'd like to answer before we uh, go through these remaining questions? Um, no, let's go ahead and go through the remaining ones and then we'll grab um, a couple at the end. Okay, all right, excellent. I did have a comment come in. I just wanted to pop this in there because it's kind of what we're talking about. So this one says the MUTCD section 2C-65 paragraph 4 states that type 1 object markers shall not be used to mark adjacent to obstruction adjacent to the roadway. Um, just something about is this incorrectly discussed earlier. So it's wanted to mention that. So that's uh, 2C.65 paragraph 4? Yes. Okay, so when we uh, read that, it says type 1 and type 4 object markers shall not be used to mark obstructions adjacent to the roadway. And so, again, the, the recording must say exactly what I said or will reflect what exactly what I said. But if, if I mentioned type 1 and type 4, I did not mean that you could use those. You know, if I said that, you would be correct. I was incorrect because what we discussed were the type two and the type three. So there's four different types of object markers, type one, two, three, and four. The type two and the type three are the ones that say that can be used for obstructions adjacent to the roadway. It's actually typed underneath those. Um, when you look those up, list them, it's also written in the language. So I guess to sum that up is, if I said you could use a type one or type four in those applications, then yes, I was wrong. If I said that I didn't mean to, I meant to just indicate that the type two and the type threes could be used for obstructions adjacent to the roadway. Yeah, absolutely. So again, appreciate uh, appreciate you having me clarify that and mentioning that just in case. Just in case perhaps it was unclear and I didn't say it correctly. Next question is, have there been studies to show that the markings from 3B.22 reduce vehicle speeds? And the answer is yes. You could check this one out. And what they're talking about there, if you remember, these were the speed reduction markings where they were on a set pattern in the lane itself. And then as we got closer to the point where we wanted you to slow down, we started putting those closer together. And so visually, as you saw those getting closer together, you would be fooled into thinking you were going faster than you were, and you would slow down to maintain that same speed. Imagine on the interstate with all the uh, fence posts from the right-of-way fence whizzing past you. As the faster you go, the closer they are together. And so it's an optical illusion. This was recommended for inclusion in the MUTCD, the 2009 version, by this particular report. And there, there's others out there, but this is the one that I would point you to first. Traffic Control Devices Pooled Fund Study, Pavement Markings for Speed Reduction. And that's where you'll you'll find um, this study. But there, there's been others too, but this is the one that recommended to be added to the MUTCD. The next question says, and we were talking about work zone traffic control at this point. It says, with less than 40 and greater than 45 at 40 miles per hour, which is greater than 40 and less than 45, what do you use? And what I believe that they're referring to is when I gave you this chart. This is the suggested advanced warning sign spacing. So now we're, we're in part six. This deals with temporary traffic control. And I gave you the typical flagger setup, road work, one lane road, flagger ahead symbol signs, if you remember road work, one lane road, the flagger ahead symbol sign. And in between the road work and the one lane road, there was a letter code C. One lane road to flagger head was B. From the flagger head to the flagger itself, this flag with the ball on the end of it is a symbol for the flagger. We had the letter code A. 
A, B, and C is the distance between the suns. And when you look this up in the MUTCD, it says it depends on where you're at. An expressway freeway, it has one set of numbers for A, B, and C. In a rural area, it's 500 feet, A, B, and C for all three. But then we have the urban in the city. When you look that up in the MUTCD, it just says urban low speed and urban high speed. But I told you that most highway agencies are going to select low speed as equal to or less than 40 miles an hour. High speed would be 45 or above. I think where the confusion came in is um, just saw the less than and the greater than signs. So to answer the question, 40 miles per hour or less, that's where most agencies would call it low speed and those signs would be 100 feet apart. 45 or higher, most agencies would say that's high speed and put it 350 feet apart. But again, the METCD doesn't specify, so your agency gets to choose what, what they want to call low speed and high speed. But I've read a lot of different states, how they've determined it, or not how, but what they've used, and this is what most use. 40 or less, low speed, 45 and above is high speed. So it means urban low speed, it'd be 100 feet from the flagger to the flagger head symbol sign, 100 feet from there to the one lane, and 100 feet from there to the road work ahead sign. Uh, another question was, is it okay to leave an unmarked crosswalk intersection as is, even if we have sidewalk curb ramps at both sides? And this came about when we were talking about crosswalk markings. Um, and so we, we discussed the fact that when you have an intersection, there's a crosswalk there at that point, whether it's marked or not. Um, there is a crosswalk there. So the, we can have an unmarked crosswalk and a marked crosswalk. And that's the question. Is it okay to leave that there? The answer really comes in the 3B.18. That's where we find the answer. So first off, they're there to provide guidance for the pedestrians uh, to delineate that path so the traffic knows that they're there. You know, those markings help to alert the driver of a designated pedestrian crossing point. Now, if it's a mid-block crosswalk, we're almost always going to have them. At, well, we are. Mid-block crosswalk, we're going to have those crosswalk lines. But what about at a um, intersection where they're not marked? That's what the question says. Paragraph 7, 3B.18, paragraph 7, really speaks to that. And it says, a location is controlled by traffic control signals or an approach is controlled by stop or yield. Crosswalk lines should be installed where en engineering judgment indicates they are needed to direct pedestrians to the proper crossing path. To me, that says it really comes down to a judgment call. So is it OK? Well. That depends. Each situation would be different, but yes, it could be okay. You know, if um, the pedestrians are not having any problem crossing there, you don't have any near misses or pedestrian vehicle conflicts, sight distance is really good. Uh, you know, as you approach that intersection, then yes, it could be okay. But there could be other cases where, yeah, you know, based on engineering judgment, we really need to add those in. Now that wraps up the questions that we received uh, and prepared from you for you guys. Uh, Kristen, do we have any other questions to address? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions. So this first one is about a two-way left turn on a multi-lane highway. Uh, so do you have to create a clear zone and remove that two-way left turn at each intersection and also at an intersection to a local road or four-legged intersection? All right, so let me, um, that is a, a good question. And the answer to that, I think we showed a slide. That's what I was going to look for is to show you because, I, again, I like the, the photos. But um, the answer 
really is for a major intersection, crossroad, yes, we would typically break the stripes there. And even for a, a minor one, crossroad, we would typically break that 2A left turn lane at that particular point. The times that we wouldn't might be for uh, commercial entrances that were minor traffic generators. And let me actually pull that up for you. Just to give you a diagram of what we're talking about. There we go. Yeah. So this drawing comes from the MUTCD part three. And I think that shows you um, the answer to the question. Now there is a difference in how you handle the two way left turn lane. Notice for the major cross street, we've transitioned the two way left turn into a left turn lane. For the minor cross street, we just broke the striping and left the gap open. Yeah. So how about, uh, other questions, Kristen? Sure. Um, this next one is talking about advanced limit lines on a multi-lane highway. So when is it required to install those at a signalized intersection and would you need an engineering study? Did you say advanced limit lines? Yes. Advanced limit line on a multi-lane highway. So actually I'm trying to Honestly, I'm having trouble with that one. I'm trying to, uh, in my mind, square away what they mean by advanced limit line. Okay. Yeah. So we, I'll, I'll forward this question to you, and you can um, get back to them um, by email. Maybe get some additional clarification on that one. Okay. Um, but with that, unless anyone else has any questions on the line, that kind of wraps it up for questions, and it kind of uh, puts a bow on things nicely. It's a, it's 11:30. They're just about 11:30. Um, actually, I just got some clarification on that. They were talking about advanced limit line is offset from crosswalk. So again, I'll forward this to you, Todd. That way you can follow up um, directly on that one. Um, Kristen, I can I can speak real quick to that. I think I know what they're talking about. They may be talking about the stop line when you have a crosswalk situation. And I'll definitely look at the question closer. But if you're talking about a stop line before you get to the crosswalk, there's a minimum of four feet from the crosswalk line to the stop lot to the stop line. Now that stop line could be further back, but no closer than four feet. All right, very good. Um, so, oh, another question just came in. Are stop bars required at uncontrolled intersections? Um, the answer to that is no, because if it's an uncontrolled intersection, that means there's no yield, no stop, anything of that nature. So they're not, uh, no, they're, they're, they would not be required. All right, very good. Um, all right, so if anyone has any additional questions, just feel free to send those to us by email. I uh, really appreciate you being here today. Hope you've enjoyed this office hour session. It's something a little bit different that we have been trying to do when we have a particular webinar or a series of sessions that has a lot of questions that go unanswered because we definitely want to um, be answering those questions and give you the opportunity um, to have some time with Todd and uh, hopefully in the future maybe someone will feel brave enough to unmute and, and ask questions so I think that was a great opportunity we really appreciate you being here I hope everyone has a great rest of the week and I also hope everyone stays safe with the upcoming hurricane for those of you that are in Florida here so Todd I'll hand things over to you to close this out all right thank you Kristen and I just want to say thank you for attending the MUTCD webinar, the signing pavement marking series, and coming to office hours. Hope you enjoyed a cup of coffee with us, and we look forward to seeing you in future workshops. Have a great rest of the day, and definitely be safe. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next time.